going to start by introducing you to a very interesting man, William Henry Brisbane. He was a Baptist minister and a slaveholder in the Sea Islands in South Carolina. And he was the editor of an important pro-slavery journal called the Southern Baptist and General Intelligence Report. So he was uh, one of the most active pro-slavery theorists before the Civil War. Uh, but uh, he was also a man of reason. And as a man of reason, he decided at one point that uh, maybe in, he, sh he should actually read what the abolitionists said. Learn about all sides. The thing is that South Carolina before the war, it was almost impossible to get pro-slavery literature. Uh, no Southern post office would deliver abolitionist literature in the South. People traveling South with such literature were subject to violence and even lynching. It was just complete censorship. And so Brisbane decided in order to learn the arguments of the other side, he would have to go North. He went North uh, uh, to Cincinnati and um, he checked out a very famous abolitionist work, Theodore Weld's Biblical Argument Against Slavery. He read uh, uh, the preface to this famous abolitionist work, uh, uh, and he was so angered by it that he sat down and just wrote six pages of dense argument, objecting to every last detail and argumentative move that Weld made just in the preface of the biblical argument. And by the end of this, he realized that all of his refutations were completely bogus. And he was converted to the abolitionist cause. <laughs> okay. Um, it's quite, he's quite a remarkable man. Um, he ended up writing his own abolitionist tract. Uh, slaveholding examined in light of the Holy Bible, uh, which became a major abolitionist bestseller in its own right. Uh, uh, and he became the toast of uh, the abolitionist circuit, uh, where it was very important to recruit people who actually had personal knowledge of slavery uh, to testify about what it was like. Because one of the things that the pro-slavery people said to the abolitionists is, you northerners, you don't know what it's like. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we, we live with the slaves and we can testify that they're happy. And you, you just exaggerate with stories about whipping and raping and so forth. So it was very important to get people with personal experience of slavery on, on the abolitionist side. So you might think that this story uh, is just a triumph of moral reasoning. And think about it from, a, you know, from any academic's point of view. I mean, isn't this brilliant? Imagine if you wrote something and your chief rival reads it and in a fury writes down a refutation of your biggest work and at the end of it is totally convinced <laughs> by what you said. Right? Isn't that like every academic dream? And indeed it was also every abolitionist dream, or I should say more specifically how the white abolitionists thought their work uh, was going to affect moral change. Um, that is, white abolitionists <coughs> in this era in the United States were hoping that people would simply read the arguments, listen to reason, be converted in their hearts to the abolitionist cause. And looks like Brisbane did just what they wanted. However, if you open the pages of Brisbane's book, which I have, and take a look at it, uh-oh, <laughs> the reasoning he used to refute slavery has certain problems with it. Um, uh, the difficulty is that the pro-slavery side's strongest suit by far in the realm of moral argument was appeals to the Bible. They knew the Bible line by line, and there's enormous amount of textual evidence in support of slavery in both the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, uh, 
And so uh, Brisbane was put in a tough spot if he was arguing for biblical morality, but that was the vernacular moral language of the United States before the Civil War. Um, so what he did was he drew a very fine logical distinction, just as any sophisticated analytical philosopher might do. He drew a distinction between slavery and lifelong bonded labor. You can read Leviticus, and it turns out it's totally legitimate to drop a contract of lifelong bonded labor. Uh, 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 and the Bible has no problem with that. So to get the Bible on the abolitionist side, he had to basically say, it's OK to have a system of lifelong bonded labor. But in America, we have slavery, and that's wrong. OK. Um, the difficulty here is that what he needed to get the better in an argument wasn't exactly what the slaves needed. Right? The slaves were not interested in replacing slavery with lifelong bonded labor. Uh, right? Uh, so we have a problem here. And I think this problem raises some interesting questions of moral epistemology. One question is, here we have Brisbane. He's working basically from a priori reasoning. He's speaking with other elites, educated white people. Uh, is that kind of reasoning sufficient to arrive at sound moral conclusions concerning the distinction between slavery and free labor. And second question we could ask is, what would change if the slaves and the freed people immediately uh, uh, upon emancipation were participating in moral inquiry? Would it change it, and would this inquiry actually be improved if uh, moral inquiry were more inclusive? And the key question we have to look at here is, to define the slavery that one opposes is, in effect, to define the freedom that will be achieved upon the abolition of slavery. And that's what makes arguments over the definition of slavery absolutely critical, and indeed became critical in the United States. The perspective I'm going to appeal to here is uh, what I explained last time. I'm drawing from John Dewey's uh, pragmatism to understand how uh, moral progress can be achieved. Here I have a different illustration from last time. This is when he was a young man teaching at the University of Michigan. Um, so just to recap, the core idea of pragmatism as a moral theory is to replace the quest for a foundational criterion of moral rightness with the quest for methods of intelligent updating of whatever moral beliefs you start off with, OK? So the move is, forget about trying to justify some fundamental moral principle from which all other moral truths might be deduced. You know, It's not about the principle of utility. It's not about the categorical imperative. It's not about the golden rule or any foundational principle. Dewey argued had many arguments that the quest for such a principle was pretty hopeless. And even if you got such a principle, then all the arguments would just evolve into how to apply it. Uh, uh, so it doesn't even help you. Instead, let's start with the range of uncodified moral beliefs that we actually have and see if we can intelligently revise them. Okay, and make them better. There are two basic ways to do this. <coughs> One is you can examine your moral beliefs, or whole societies can examine the moral beliefs that they've actually enforced uh, in social practices and see whether they've been shaped by systematic biases, moral biases, biases in moral thinking. Uh, and here, the basic intuition of pragmatists is pretty much the same as the basic idea uh, in feminist epistemology, which is that biases are asymmetrically distributed across social positions. 
So a bias held by one group is not necessarily held by another group. You put them into communication with each other and effective forms of collective inquiry in which the excluded groups are able to influence uh, uh, the groups who are kind of running the show, and you can at least improve. You can help counteract those biases. It doesn't mean you eliminate them altogether, but that you can at least make incremental, you can chip away at those biases and improve moral thinking that way. Uh, uh, and this is all done through contestation. So the idea is not that members of different groups are sitting around a seminar table and just exchanging reasons in pure moral argument. The idea is that moral ideas have to be challenged through practical action in the world, where people are actively rejecting and manifesting their opposition to uh, the reigning moral norms uh, uh, in ways that are more or less disruptive of uh, uh, business as usual. And the second idea that Dewey had was that practical norms, including moral norms, can be tested in experiments and living. So last time I was focusing mostly on the moral bias part, and this lecture I'm focusing mainly, but not exclusively, on the idea of testing norms with experiments and living. And the general idea here is that we can actually gather empirical evidence for or against a moral norm by putting it into practice and seeing whether that norm solves the problem that we conceived it, that we needed to solve with <coughs> acceptable side effects. So the key here is that we have to interpret practical norms as attempted solutions to problems. We have to define the problem and interpret the norm as attempting to solve that problem. We put those norms into practice, see whether they actually solve the problems with acceptable side effects. But here's another key, is that in the course of implementing our uh, moral principles and realizing them in actual social practices, uh, you know, new problems, unanticipated effects arise. And so we're constantly revising and refining our conception of the problems that we need to be solved so that they also include decent accommodation with other side effects we hadn't thought of ahead of time. Okay, so our conception of the problems and our conception of moral ideals are revised in light of experiences in trying to realize them. So let's think about then uh, what, sla what problem slavery was trying to solve. And if you read the pro-slavery literature uh, of this era, uh, and the Americans had by far the most sophisticated pro-slavery thought around, uh, uh, much more sophisticated than uh, uh, what Europeans had come up with, partly just because they had more years and <laughs> more contestation with abolitionists, so they had to recone their arguments. The argument came down to the idea that slavery is needed to solve the problem of civilization. So let's think about what the problem of civilization was understood to be at the time. Civilization requires an advanced division of labor. Okay, what, what do you need for civilization? You need government, army, navy, merchants, manufacturers, commerce, schools, ministers, churches, right? An elaborate division of labor in which a substantial portion of the population is not simply growing the means of subsistence. Now, in order for that, these people in the more advanced positions uh, that are really making civilization what it is, to survive, that requires that the farmers produce a surplus, right? They had to produce more than what they need to survive themselves so that that food can be consumed by intellectual laborers and artisans, manufacturers, merchants, and so forth. Um, so the problem of civilization is, comes down to the problem of producing a surplus, okay? How do you get the people who are growing the food 
to produce enough to sustain and advance the vision of labor. The pro-slavery people all shared a common view of what the problem was. Economists today call it the backward bending supply curve of labor, right? The theory was that people would, uh, you know, here we have a standard upward sloping supply curve of labor. The higher you're, you're paid, the more hours you work until you hit subsistence. But the theory was as soon as producers of certain critical uh, crops hit subsistence, they would quit work. Why work anymore? If you raise their wages, they're just going to pull back on the hours that they have to work because they can meet their subsistence needs with fewer hours if you raise the wage. So on this construction, it follows that some form of forced labor is necessary in order to produce a surplus and hence sustain civilization. This is the fundamental argument for forced labor, the, the key political economy argument. There were other arguments too, biblical arguments, arguments about original sin and so forth, but here we're just looking at the political economy argument uh, for slavery. Uh, it's, it absolutely pervades the pro-slavery literature. And we should point out that in this era, forced labor was completely pervasive uh, uh, across the world. It's been estimated that before the mid-18th century, about 95% of the entire labor force served under some kind of involuntary servitude or other. It's all, all different forms, not just slavery, but serfdom, indentured service, apprenticeship, debt peonage, a million and a half different ways <coughs> to force people to work. Um, British Navy, uh, right? It's impressed sailors. And it, impressment was nothing like the draft today. <laughs> It was way worse, not just because the conditions of being in the Navy were way worse, but because you didn't get any advance notice. What happened was the British Navy would land in a port, and they'd be seeking out a wedding. Why would they go to a wedding? They're wedding crashers. Because that's where young, healthy, strong men, the groom and the groomsmen would be there, they crash the wedding party, kidnap them all, and shove them on to the boats and ship off. Okay? <laughs> no wedding night for these poor guys. <laughs> okay? So, forced labor was pretty much the norm. And indeed, even the workers at the time, even in England, which was considered freer than most of the other countries in the world, if you actually looked at the content of the English common law of master and servant, we look at it today and we would say none of these workers was really free. And in q and I'll tell you a little bit about what that law was like. Now, of course, this argument had its limitations because slavery was way worse than other forms of forced labor. And in four particular ways, it was way worse. One was just the extremity of the violence that was inflicted on the slaves. It's not that other workers weren't subjected to violence. Sailors, for instance, were flogged, common, okay? But slaves had just sort of the, the, the scale of the violence uh, was much higher. Secondly, slaves were, legally speaking, property of another person. And a very important implication of this was that they had no rights to their families. So here we have a slave auction, right? The daughter is being auctioned off to a different owner from her mother, right? Families could be broken up. Slaves had no right to family. No right to family integrity, keep the family together. Parents had no authority over their children. Uh, uh, no rights in that respect. And fourthly, slaves suffered under a condition that was known as civil slavery. Uh, <clears throat> which consisted in basically the denial of a set of legal rights. They had no rights to own property, no rights to make contracts, uh, no rights to legal redress if somebody made them a promise, even to pay wages. Uh, they could work and then the wages perhaps wouldn't be paid. 
and uh, uh, this is very common in urban slavery in places like Baltimore. Um, but there was no legal enforcement of any contract. Uh, and they also didn't have the right to testify in court against any white person uh, who might have abused them, assaulted them, and so forth. Uh, they did have the right actually to actually testify in their own defense if they were put on a criminal trial, but they were not allowed to testify against whites who might have done violence to them. And that systematic stripping away of legal personhood uh, is the condition known as civil slavery, and that was imposed on slaves. And so this gets us back then to Brisbane's problem. Okay, let's define the condition of minimal abolition as just abolishing these four features that distinguish slavery from other forms of forced labor, and say you abolish that, but then you're willing to tolerate oppressive servitude affected by contract. That was essentially Brisbane's position. Okay, you abolish the four features that made slavery worse than other forms of involuntary servitude, but you're willing to, you know, countenance all the rest. So let's just recap now. Pragmatism gives us two basic ideas. One is you explore the problem that a moral norm is supposed to solve and you test alternative solutions. And secondly, you mobilize the excluded to contest and counter the biases embodied in the solutions which have been instituted and enforced by the powerful. Now, let's just talk a little bit about bias. Uh, and I'm going to point to a particular kind of bias that's very pervasive, uh, drawing on some philosophical work by feminist philosopher Sally Hasslinger at MIT. She gives us a conception of a bias that is known as objectification within feminist theory. And we can boil down objectification to three different things. One is a tendency to view a group of people in terms of its service to one's own desires. Secondly, the enforcement of that view by placing the group in a subordinate role so that members of that group have to serve one's own desires. Okay. And thirdly, representing that group as inherently fit for serving that role and unfit for serving any superior, non-subordinate role. Anyone can recognize three as a version of uh, what social psychologists call the fundamental attribution error. That is, you observe some conduct, people behaving in a subordinate way, and you attribute the reason why they're behaving that way to features internal to them. Oh, it just must be their nature to act this way, rather than seeing their behavior as being brought about by their circumstances, by the fact that basically they're being forced. Um, so let's think about objectification uh, uh, in the context of American racialized slavery. So we're looking at white racial objectification of blacks. Uh, Whites at this time, actually not just in the United States, but I think in uh, European uh, uh, slavery in uh, the, uh, the New World, they viewed blacks as good for menial labor, principally for the production of cash crops. In the Caribbean, it was mainly sugar and coffee, a little bit of indigo. The United States, it was some sugar, tobacco, and cotton was the big thing right up to the Civil War, uh, and a little bit of rice. They enforce this view through slavery, okay? Uh, and then they represented blacks as inherently fit for slavery and unfit for freedom. This completely pervades the pro-slavery writings, okay? So here's a characteristic case. Thomas Dew, who's the president of College of William and Mary, wrote a very famous pro-slavery tract uh, in 1832. Very characteristic statement. All the pro-slavery literature, they're saying exactly the same thing here. So Dew said, 
Negroes are not actuated by that principle which inclines more civilized men to work after the necessaries of the day have been procured. Okay? He's pointing to the problem of civilization, right? Only he's racializing it. Okay, so he thinks whites will be perfectly willing to work beyond their subsistence needs, that they have a desire for self-improvement, okay? And, and if you raise the wage, they're not going to pull back on their work effort because they want to improve themselves, so they'll, earn, they'll actually work harder, okay? Whereas blacks, he thought, wouldn't. The moment they met subsistence needs, they just want to lay in a hammock, okay? Their industry and their freedom, therefore, are entirely incompatible, okay? That was a very key argument uh, that pro-slavery writers uh, made in favor of slavery. And you can see it's just a form of racial justification. Enter our hero of political economy, Adam Smith, okay? He made the key argument against all forms of forced labor, okay? And we have to keep in mind that our current image of Adam Smith as some far-right guy advocating laissez-faire to the detriment of the working people is just completely false and pulled entirely out of context. In fact, in the context in which Smith was writing, one has to keep in mind that essentially every single time the government intervened in the market, it was always on behalf of the rich. Virtually always. Well, no wonder it would actually make sense then to be laissez-faire because Right, what he meant was he's trying to break up uh, uh, state-granted monopolies that were preventing working people from working in various trades. Uh, he would oppose uh, a primogenitor, which, which forbade the breaking up of estates, uh, large estates. And he opposed every single form of forced labor Specifically, he opposed serfdom, he opposed indentured servitude, he opposed apprenticeship, which was basically just forced labor of children, and he opposed slavery. So what was his argument? Uh, he's giving a political economy argument. Wealth of Nations, Book 1, Chapter 8. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, the liberal reward of labor increases the industry of the common people. You can trust the common people, all common people. The other very important point about Smith is that he argued that human nature is universal. Everybody's the same. There's no racial distinctions here. Okay? Working people, you pay them more, they're going to work harder. But what about those slaves? The masters were saying uh, the, the slaves will only work if we whip them. And Smith had an argument. He explained why the slaves would only work if they were whipped. Because the slaveholders refused to give them any opportunity to improve themselves from their labor. Right? If they worked harder, it wasn't as if they would get more. No, they'd just be completely exploited. No wonder they had to be forced. So here, Smith is essentially identifying that the slaveholders, the pro-slavery writers, were uh, uh, engaged in an attribution error. They were misattributing the source of the, the slaves' unwillingness to work as hard as they wanted. And Smith also made the argument that free labor in general is more productive than slave labor. Free people are willing to work harder because they actually have a chance to gain from their labor. So it, he was uh, uh, embraced by abolitionists worldwide for making this argument. I want to make it clear that moral abolitionists didn't depend critically on Smith's argument to shore up their own moral beliefs. They had a purely moral argument for the abolition of slavery, but they found appealing to Smith very useful when they were trying to persuade uh, others to give up on slavery. Um, 
So essentially what Smith was doing is he's advancing the conventional view of economists today that the supply curve of labor is uh, steadily sloping uphill, right? That is, the more, the higher the real wage, the more people are willing to work, okay? And what I've illustrated here is Smith's hypothesis. So basically everything to the right of the green you know, the labor supply curve, of course, is the voluntary labor supply curve. It's what people are willing to offer when they're not coerced. So everything to the right of uh, that green curve there, of course, is the realm of forced labor. But I'm interested in this region here. Slaves were getting, at best, subsistence. In practice, as we'll see, they're getting a little bit less than subsistence. Okay, and I'll explain why they were getting a little bit less. So they're in the forced region. and Smith's hypothesis was that, you know, slavery's around here or at best there, but if you actually paid the slaves a wage, you know, they'd be up here, they'd be working harder, they'd be working more hours than the slaves and hence produce more. Okay, that was, that was what Smith thought and that's what the abolitionists thought. Okay, and indeed upon the abolition of slavery, when Parliament passed uh, the abolition bill in 1833, uh, uh, the, the government actually declared that they were running a mighty experiment in free labor, testing Smith's hypothesis. Okay, so here we're talking principally of Jamaica, but there are a bunch of other uh, Caribbean colonies where the British were abolishing slavery. But people were also looking closely at other uh, abolitionist experiments. Haiti, of course, is the first. Uh, uh, and in the United States, in, uh, there were early free labor experiments that were run by the Union Army during the Civil War. So the Union Army was invading the Confederate states and taking over territory. They, <coughs> You know, it's large plantations, they're falling into Union hands, and the Army's wondering, what are we going to do with these plantations? Maybe they would be of use, but of course they're anti-slavery. They can't run them using slave labor. So they started running a variety of free labor experiments. Very famous one in Port Royal. Port Royal was actually occupied uh, by the Union forces pretty early in the war. Uh, uh, and that was William Henry Brisbane's area, was around Port Royal, South Carolina. And that, the Union Army also uh, took over the Mississippi River fairly early. Very rich plantations there in Helena, uh, Natchez, and Davis Bend. That was where Jefferson Davis had his plantation. Okay, So the Union takes it over, and they start running experiments in free labor. Okay, and they explicitly, self-consciously understood as experiments. They want to see how the de facto freed people, this is of course long before the, it's, it's actually before the Emancipation Proclamation, clearly before 13th Amendment, uh, but they're running these free labor experiments. Okay, and they want, they're, basically they're testing whether Smith was right. Uh, uh, so, or more particularly what they're testing are these questions, very normatively loaded questions. Government people and whites were most interested in testing the question of whether civilization can progress without forced labor. And this had two sub-questions. One was whether free labor would prove more productive than slave labor, as Smith held. And secondly, whether the slaves were fit for freedom. <coughs> That is, <clears throat> upon emancipation, when they behave in a civilized manner, which was largely defined <clears throat> in, in, in terms of, you know, would they be industrious? Would they be self-improving? That is, they want to work for, uh, work harder for a higher wage. Would they be law-abiding? Would they be good Christians too? Was part of it. Um, slaves had a different question in mind. <laughs> with this experiment, what they wanted to know was, would emancipation actually deliver real freedom? <laughs> that was the question they, that, that was on their minds. Uh, rather different question. Now what's important here is that the highlighted terms, the red terms here, these of course are hotly contested terms. What does civilization mean? What does freedom mean? And so forth. Uh, 
Um, and so from a pragmatist's point of view, as people you know, argue and contest these terms, the content uh, gets refined uh, upon reflections and experiments in living. Okay, people are trying to work out on the ground what freedom really means in practice. Okay, so uh, it's important then to bring in the perspective of the slaves or the de facto freed people, the people who are being uh, freed uh, in the United States with the advance of the Union Army. So the freed people and radical Republicans actually had a fairly common view of what freedom meant. And we can represent this in terms of a standard economist preference ordering. What freed people and radical Republicans meant by true freedom, full freedom, was you are a self-employed person. You are your own boss. You don't have another boss telling you what to do. So the ideal from a farmer's point of view is to be a yeoman farmer, right? You have your own plot of land, you own your own farm, and it's just you and your family farming it. You're not taking orders from anybody. That's what it meant to be a free person, both for the radical Republicans in the Republican Party and for the newly free people. Failing that, uh, in the American context, sharecropping would be the next best outcome. Okay, so in this arrangement, uh, uh, they wouldn't get to own the land, but they would still get a plot. Uh, uh, and in order to get access to the land, they would have to hand over a certain percentage of their crop uh, uh, to the landowner, but they would still be able to farm it as an individual family and still be autonomous, you know, within the context, right? There's no, nobody whipping them or overseeing their labor. They're, they're doing their own labor under their own recognizance. And the worst <coughs> option of all, the worst outcome would be if they were stuck with plantation gang labor. That is, they're, they're on the plantations working pretty much the way they did under slavery in these gangs with an overseer minutely regulating all their productive activity, uh, but with the difference that because they were free, they could no longer be whipped and they had to be paid a wage, okay? So that would be, uh, the free people, basically their preference ordering is they want to be a yeoman farmer, failing that, they'll live with sharecropping. The last thing they want is the same old content of labor as before, only being paid a wage and not being subject to whipping. However, the planter class, <laughs> right, and government, a lot of government policymakers had exactly the opposite preference ranking, right? What they wanted was, let's keep everything the same, only we'll pay them a wage and give up the whip. Okay, this was also, of course, the British the same way, right? They wanted everything as before, except now they'll pay a wage, give up the whip. Failing that, they'll settle on sharecropping, but the last thing they wanted was the freed people to own their own land and be able to decide everything for themselves. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we can see the plantation gang labor option is pretty similar to Brisbane's notion of minimal abolition, right? You try to keep the basic system of production as close as possible to slavery, but, you know, you're paying them a wage, there's contracts here, they have legal rights, and so forth. What actually happened? So uh, here we can see what happened. Uh, the slave production, here I'm looking at sugar because that was a common crop across the United States and Caribbean. Uh, you can see sugar production fell dramatically post-emancipation, almost uniformly. It's a little bit of an increase in Barbados. I can tell you in Q&A why that was so. Everywhere else, sugar production really fell dramatically, especially in Haiti uh, uh, and Louisiana. Okay, looks very bad for Smith's experiment uh, uh, in political economy. So we have to ask, was Smith wrong? And Smith said, "Look, you free the slaves, you're going to be even more productive than before." So was Smith wrong? Well, 
Empirically, we know that sugar production per worker was higher under the slave system than post-emancipation in all, uh, uh, virtually all the post-emancipation societies. And the reason for this was that no free worker was willing to work on the plantations at the extreme intensity and continuity of slaves. Brit Britain sent out, the colonial office actually sent out observers to figure out what was going on because their plantations are collapsing. What was going on? And one observer calculated that under the slave system, slaveholders could count on an 18 hour a day, seven days a week <laughs> in Jamaica. Okay, whereas post-emancipation, the freed people would only work six hours a day, four days a week. Okay, and this is primarily sugar plantations, and, and you should know something about sugar production, which is, it was the first truly industrialized mode of production, even, even before cotton. And it was the most horrendous form of labor imaginable. Just give you a sense of how horrible it was. Remember, we're under the hot Caribbean sun, <laughs> okay? Uh, when a sugar cane ripens, you have about 24 hours to harvest it before it ferments, and then it's rotten, it's no good. So imagine the incredible intensity and fury of labor that it takes. And cane is really hard to cut. You have these machetes, you know, chance of like accidentally chopping off fingers and so forth. Then the cane has to be hauled to these massive rollers <coughs> that crush it. And there were no safety mechanisms on this machine. So if by chance your fingers got stuck in the roller as you're feeding the cane into it, well, it would just eat up your arm and like crush you along with the cane. Massive amounts of industrial accidents, absolutely grueling work. None of us could last more than an hour doing this under the hot Caribbean sun. And look at the grueling labor, okay? No free person is willing to put up with that. So <clears throat> emancipation then led to fewer total labor hours per free p p person, and in particular, women were withdrawing from field labor. It's also important to remember that in the Caribbean, women actually were the principal field laborers. Uh, uh. <clears throat> the free people also shifted a lot of their labor effort from production of cash crops, production of subsistence crops, food. Okay. And hence, tropical stable production had to decline. But it wasn't completely eliminated. You can see that except in Haiti, there was still substantial sugar production going on. It was just a lot less than before. Okay. So this is how the conservatives interpreted what was going on. And I'll give a very characteristic quote from Sir Henry Taylor of the Colonial Office, although you can see the same thing repeated all over the place. Um, <coughs> he said, look, this proves that blacks have no desire for self-improvement. You pay them a wage, you're not working harder. They slack back, they're on the hammock. Uh, he said, blacks in uh, the Caribbean who'd been freed, they have abandoned civilization for barbarism, right? They're not producing a surplus, they're just focusing on subsistence, okay? Because uh, they don't, they want to work. They're innately lazy, he thought. Uh, they've lapsed into idleness and sloth, and hence, Taylor said Smith was wrong, at least for blacks, at least for tropical stable production like sugar. Now, free people, of course, had a completely different interpretation of what was going on here, and I'll quote Frederick Douglass, uh, who was observing the same events. Uh, first, for, the first point to make is that he understood the epistemology of the situation. He, he really nailed it. He said, look, Experience proves that it takes more than one class of people to tell the whole truth about matters in which they're interested on opposite sides. A very important point of epistemology. You can't just hear one side they're interested, right? You gotta hear all sides, and that's of course a fundamental practice point and a deep point in feminist epistemology. Um, so how did he explain what was going on? He said, look, the trouble is not that the colored people are indolent, but that no matter how hard or how persistent may be their industry, they get barely enough for their labor to support life at the very low point at which we find them. So Douglas here is siding with Smith and saying that colonial office and white racists, they're just engaged in the fundamental attribution error. They're not looking at the circumstances uh, which, uh, under which the free people were laboring. They're just attributing the outcomes, their conduct, to innate 
dispositions to be lazy and barbaric. Uh, <clears throat> so now we have to ask, why did the freed people reduce uh, the intensity of their labor on the plantations? Well, a chief reason is they were shifting to subsistence away from cash crops just in order to survive. And they were also shifting, women in particular were shifting a lot of their labor off field labor in order to take care of their kids. Why was this important? Well, Saint-Domingue, which became the independent country of Haiti, there was a 5 to 10 percent annual death rate of slaves from overwork, malnutrition, brutal treatment, disease, and so forth. They're dying. This, these, this slave labor, they're like death camps. Okay? And that's why the Caribbean countries needed a constant influx of new slaves from Africa. It wasn't just saint the It wasn't just the French colonies. Similar death rates were seen all across the West Indies. Uh, 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 it, sugar production was by far the most brutal and cruel kinds of, of production that the slaves were uh, subjected to. <clears throat> so here you can see what happened. This is the Haitian population. 1790, they're still under slavery. It's about a half a million. Almost all of these people are slaves. Okay. Uh, and you can see what happens upon emancipation for the first time. There isn't very much immigration after the abolition of slavery, right? No more imports from Africa. It's a little bit trickles of immigration actually from the United States to, and a few other places to the independent country of Haiti, but not, not enough to actually substantially change these figures. 1823, you see the population booms. Okay, for the first time, by shifting their labor away from cash cropping towards subsistence, they're able not just to maintain their population, but to grow it. Okay, so you see a much healthier population here. Okay. What about the American case? The American case was actually unique uh, 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 in uh, the New World in that the slave population was capable of reproducing itself without constant imports. So it's a somewhat different situation. Nevertheless, I still think that uh, you can see that what was being offered to the slaves was somewhat below subsistence, but it's reflected in child mortality data. Okay, so here you can see, by the time they hit 20, there's really no difference between uh, slave and free mortality. Okay, but if you look early in childhood, <clears throat> you see spectacular high child mortality rates for the slaves. Okay, at birth, one to four, just gigantic rates of child mor mortality. What was going on here? Basically, what was going on is that under the slave system, women who had just given birth or had very tiny children were still forced to work in the fields. Children, then they don't get adequately nourished as infants because they can't breastfeed, so they're finding substitute foods that are no good. So you see really high death rate from malnutrition. Uh, and also neglect, because, uh, you know, they would only assign, like, maybe an older child to look after the infants. It, it was just an impossible situation, so <clears throat> they're dying. And so you can see here, women were withdrawing their labor so they could basically ensure that their children would survive. The second reason why they reduced their labor <clears throat> was that wage labor was actually deliberately designed not to pay <coughs> and offered few prospects for improvement. All across post-emancipation societies in the New World, uh, the first initial phases of emancipation really amounted to nothing more than minimal abolition, and some form of bondage was retained. Even in Haiti, that was true in the earliest phases. Uh, uh, so if you don't have the right to quit your, you know, working for your former master and get others to bid for your labor, it's very hard to get a chance to improve your wage rate. During the Civil War labor experiments, uh, uh, these labor experiments are sometimes run by the Union Army, sometimes by the Treasury Department, but in either way, wages were dictated. Okay, so there's no bargaining going on. Uh, uh, and employers uh, uh, would commonly make deductions. If they disapproved of how intensely the freed person was working, they would just say, I'm going to withhold 
some portion of the wage, or they would just commit outright fraud. They'd say, I'm paying you so much, so many dollars a week, and then they'd pay half that. And also, because of the disruptions of the war, it was very hard for the Union to actually deliver promised wages, even when the Army was running. So they weren't really getting paid consistently. In Jamaica, uh, uh, <coughs> people went down there and they found out that, it, that you couldn't even live on the plantation wages that were being offered. So they had to engage in some subsistence cropping just in order to survive. And the third reason uh, why the freed people withdrew uh, a lot of labor hours from uh, cash cropping was they had other things to do with their lives. They worked relentlessly. They wanted to improve themselves, but not in the way that the colonial office and uh, uh, business people in the United States uh, desired. So here I'm going to take testimony from uh, northerners, uh, abolitionists who went down to Port Royal. And uh, what they did was they were running some of these free labor experiments. Here's Laura Town with her students in Port Royal. So she set up schools. And William Gannett, another abolitionist, they're setting up schools and so forth. And what they found was an incredible hunger for learning. If there's anything the freed people wanted, it was to learn. Okay, education uh, uh, was what they wanted. So they observed that the Negroes would do anything for us if only we will teach them, which was lucky because they had a hard time coming up with cash wages, but schooling uh, was a substitute. And so in the end, I think Smith was mostly vindicated here. All the testimony from the Treasury and the Army agents are sending letters back, uh, 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 you know, uh, to Washington, D.C., explaining what's going on in these experiments. They all testified that freed people would work harder on their own account than if they were on wages or gang labor. Uniformly observed exactly what Smith predicted. People are working harder if they work for themselves than if they work for others. They observed that the freed people worked harder if they were paid more, if they were paid on time, if they were paid honestly. Seems to make sense. And they also observed that truck farming was paying more than plantation labor. <laughs> right, no wonder. So they're producing vegetables and bringing it to market, right, whatever surplus. And that was actually more profitable uh, uh, than the plantation labor. So no wonder they were shifting to food production rather than cotton. Uh, <clears throat> so by and large, Smith's hypothesis of the increasing uh, supply of labor with higher wages is vindicated, except that Smith made one mistake, is that the slave point, instead of being here, less than the equilibrium wage, is actually way out here in the force region, but that's because they're being worked to death, or at least their children are dying, right? No free person would ever work that hard. So William Henry Brisbane comes back to our story, because not only was he a noted abolitionist after giving up on the pro-slavery side, uh, but he was appointed as a U.S. tax commissioner at Port Royal. Okay, so what was his job as a tax commissioner? Um, <clears throat> the Union <laughs> Army had confiscated all these plantations, okay, and now wanted to sell them off because they had to pay for the war. Okay, and uh, there was a great conflict in Port Royal about the terms of the sale. Uh, the free people, of course, each wanted a farm of their own. And so they wanted an arrangement very similar to homesteading out west that was offered to whites. Let us, give us a plot sufficient to farm, and let us work it for a certain number of years and obtain title basically through sweat equity. Or maybe with a very slow payment up front, but obviously they didn't have accumulated capital to pay very much. Brisbane, now remember, he was an advocate of minimal abolition. Okay, so his idea was, no, we're going to retain these big plantations and have the slaves, the freed people work them as before, only now for a wage. Okay, that was his picture. And because he was empowered as a tax commissioner, he was the run, running the land auctions, and he decided basically to auction it off the highest bidder. And the free people just couldn't compete because they didn't have the money. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> Laura Town, 
uh, abolitionist, she took the, the free people's point of view there, and she complained against Brisbane and the other uh, U.S. officials who were enforcing this policy. They forced men to prove they are fit to be free by holding a tyrant's power over them. They're, she's articulating the perspective on freedom that both the freed people and the radical Republicans had. Okay. Uh, so what happened in practice? In practice, the American experiment was limited, <clears throat> but it was not completely reversed. Okay. In fact, what happened was the equilibrium position turned out to be sharecropping. Right? The free people all wanted to be independent farmers. The planter class and government policymakers wanted to retain the big plantations and keep overseers and so forth. But in fact, what happened was sharecropping. And let's think about how that happened and why sharecropping turned out to be, in most parts of the South, the equilibrium position. Uh, and we can just think about this from an economic point of view. Um, <clears throat> remember, the free people were withdrawing labor from the fields. Okay, they reduced the total number of hours worked. In effect, that's the equivalent of a general strike. Okay, only they didn't have to organize into labor unions in order to achieve that. Why? Because no, because they're in the force region. Right, middle abolition, that's still in the force region. No free person was willing to work at that level of intensity because if, if they weren't dying, their kids were dying from it. They're not going to do that. So each has a sufficient individual incentive, even without labor organization, to withdraw their labor hours. And as we know from standard economics, right, you, you cut back uh, uh, on the labor supply, you get a higher wage. Okay, uh, and the wage was taken in, 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 in the form of not just higher monetary wages, but a different structure of labor itself. The free people also wanted the mode of production to be different, each on their own individual family plot, so that they would get some kind of autonomy and not be under the thumb of some overseer. Okay, so now let's bring this back to pragmatism and think about what, what was learned from this experiment. <clears throat> Remember, pragmatism says we explore the problem the norm is supposed to solve and to test alternative solutions. And we mobilize the excluded to counter the biases embodied in the solutions that have been enforced by the powerful. And I think what happens here with slaves contesting the gang labor <coughs> system and refusing to go along with it, what they achieved was what I'll call an incremental correction of white racist objectification bias. So remember that objectification bias consisted in the following three things. Viewing blacks as good for menial labor and cash crime. <clears throat> Enforcing that view now post-emancipation by limiting abolition to its minimal form, that is trying to keep the freed people under a plantation gang labor system. And representing blacks is inherently fit for gang labor and unfit for any degree of labor autonomy. You could read the immediate post-emancipation uh, uh, writings, and this is, this is what they thought. Okay. Uh, but the free people contested point two, right? Uh, and they, in fact, won a very limited form of autonomy with the sharecropping system. It's not free by any modern standards of freedom, but it was dramatically freer than slavery. Okay. Or even the plantation gang labor. And another thing they showed is that sharecropping of cotton, unlike sugar, actually succeeded in sustaining very high volume production. There's complicated reasons for that I explain later. And so as a result, you read the literature and whites' views did incrementally change. And they ended up having to concede that blacks were at least fit for the limited form of autonomy that they had under the sharecropping system. It's far from, an, from abandonment of racism, but it's way better than the view <clears throat> of what slaves were capable of uh, under slavery. So what was ultimately learned from uh, these early free labor experiments? Well, firstly, the rationale for slavery was undermined. Uh, People came to realize that civilization was never really at stake. 
in any of these things. Cash crop production, even in the sugar colonies, uh, except for Haiti, continued. And so what real, the only stakes here were the price of staples, okay? Price of sugar went up, okay? Uh, uh, and the returns to labor went up. But civilization didn't collapse, okay? Far from it. Um, more slowly, I think what <coughs> happened was that these struggles over the meaning of freedom helped reshape people's ideals of civilization and what freedom actually means. And most importantly, again, this is a much slower development, um, but in the course of contestation over the content of freedom, uh, uh, it, people came to see that a civilization in which everyone could reap at least some of its benefits is superior to one in which some people are gratuitously denied all the benefits of civilization. And that was a concession that was wrested by very heated contestation uh, by the freed people themselves. But it, it was ultimately successfully wrested. Um, <clears throat> and another thing that was ultimately wrested, I think, from the powers that be were that free labor has to mean something more than just getting paid cash rather than subsistence. It's not just about getting paid. Free labor involves having some kind of self-directed scope. Uh, so what can we learn today? Uh, taking up Brisbane's case again, I think we can see that we can't really rely on pure a priori moral reasoning to get good answers. Uh, it's subject to systematic biases, and it's liable to neglect the interests of those who are not actually participating in moral inquiry. Uh, a more reliable form of moral inquiry <clears throat> has to enlist the participation of everybody. Uh, it has to contest people's biases in action and not just in argument. Uh, and it has to test moral norms in experience and not just in hypothetical thought experiments. <coughs> uh, so this is something I think uh, we can learn from studying how moral transformation actually takes place in real societies. Uh, <coughs> and it's a way in which social scientists, sociologists, and economists can help us think more clearly uh, uh, about moral problems. Thank you. Do you want to just call on people yourself? Yeah, sure. That's fine. Yeah. There's also a sign-up sheet going around, so if you can keep that going around for Haven Center announcements. So. <clears throat> the floor is open. Help thinking about the speed with which norms, moral beliefs around marriage have changed. Yeah. Around same sex marriage. Yeah. You know, kind of un probably the most rapid change in history on any That's what major. global scientists tell me. At least you look at survey research. Yeah. It's just, there's been no faster change in American public opinion that's right. ever been measured. And especially uh, if you look by age. Yes. Right? So, Real life experiments play some role. You know, there was an initial movement, but it seems much more like there's something else going on here, tipping point issues and, yes. uh, and intergenerational issues yes. that um, are not included in this kind of discussion. I just, right. If you just reflect upon. Right. Okay, so my analysis of what's going on was the critical mode that the gay rights movement made was a concerted and collective effort to get out of the closet. And what getting out of the closet did is reveal to people that the experiment that was already being run, <laughs> right? It's like people didn't realize that their children, their coworkers, their friends, their neighbors, were gay, 
And they'd already been having like perfectly decent relationships with these people, and cooperating, friend, friendships, love, loving them as family members and so forth. And so all these people were secretly gay and you know, civilization wasn't collapsing. <laughs> Only now, coming out of the closet, many people realized that. So it was like the experiment was being run, but people didn't realize it until they came out of the closet. So that, that I think, because of the unique features um, uh, of, of, of closeting, you could, you could affect very rapid change. I think there are other things going on, too. And another thing, which I was stressing more in my first <coughs> lecture, is that moral norms are accepted and by people pretty much the same grounds as any social norm. So most of the time, people obey a moral norm because basically they know that other people expect them to conform and they expect others to conform. And people are kind of holding each other in this equilibrium as soon as they, it, it, so that's you get a tipping point. As soon as you realize enough people aren't, aren't going along with this norm anymore of homophobia, the whole thing collapses very quickly. Because, because it's not really, there's only a few hardcore believers who like have all these elaborate arguments. And it was also very quickly revealed those arguments didn't hold much water. <laughs> so this is really interesting, although much more depressing than yesterday's last talk about Quakers, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I, so I want to push a little bit on the lack of interests in your account. Yeah. So, I think that there are a lot of whites in the South who had a very firm interest in retaining an existing racial order. And that the pressure on former, well, I'm just thinking of Rich Eric Foner's work on Reconstruction. There were yeah. lots of people who came down and tried open schools, recognized yeah. ex-slaves wanting autonomy, yeah. teaching their kids, and lots of whites saying, we're going to absolutely restore the old order. And the KKK organizes and starts lynches. Lynches yeah. become really common and restrict them. So, how does that fit in your story? Right, okay. So it turns out that during the Reconstruction era, there were actually a good number of progressive whites in the South who were building multiracial, you know, at least biracial coalitions. Uh, uh, and, you know, it was, a, you know, there was a real question about, it was clearly not the former slave arm. Right, the former slave owners, they're hardcore white supremacist racists. They, they're completely intransigent. Uh, they're not willing to accept defeat in the Civil War. But of course, they're a minority of the white population. So the question is, how are you going to, you know, there's a struggle over the, the allegiance of the non-slave holding whites. Okay. And during Reconstruction, there were actually a lot of promising progressive developments because a lot of these whites were downtrodden themselves from a class perspective. A lot of them saw real advantages in aligning with um, the uh, free people. So I think actually the outcomes here were much more contingent than one might think. And I, I believe that with a more concerted effort of the federal government things could have turned out very differently in the South. And had the federal government done the really radical thing, which wasn't really feasible, but had they really broken up those big plantations and dispossessed the master class, then, you, then the, the United States would be sweet. It <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just seems to me that your account at the moment doesn't yeah. really give any explanation for why that didn't happen. So, because yeah. you're focusing entire, I mean, the fact that what's his name becomes the tax commissioner and makes yeah. this decision seems to be the only active moment at which the decision was made not to do 48% of Oh, well, yeah, so I, you know, <laughs> I can only tell a very small piece of the story, okay? Um, and so I was focusing particularly on this political economy angle and how it was that the freed people managed to rest from the former slave holding class an outcome that they definitely didn't want. Okay, the slave holding class, if they were gonna have abolition shoved down their throat, what they wanted was minimal abolition. So the interesting outcome is like, why didn't they get that? <laughs> Given that they retained a hold on the land, their possessions were not broken up. Uh, uh, 
So that's what I, that I was really focusing on. But of course, there's a whole politics about this. And you know, deep down, there's no way to explain what actually happened post-Reconstruction without bringing in mass violence. And that kind of violence had nothing to do with contestation. They're just getting what they want. I, I want to pick up on this, because a couple of times on, um, in private conversations we've had, I've brought up this visit by William Barber, the head of the NAACP in North Carolina, this Moral Monday movement. And during the account of his explanation of the building of that movement, and with the influence, actually, of a former UW history professor, Tim Tyson, he's been doing lots of reading on North Carolina history. Yeah. What's most influential in the formation of the, what they're doing in North Carolina right now was post-Reconstruction, or during the Reconstruction, post-Civil War, in 1868 in North Carolina, they wrote a new constitution driven by this coalition yeah. of freed blacks and progressive whites, which included, and he emphasized this several times, the, or a little revision of this right to life, liberty, and happiness, the pursuit of happiness. He emphasized that it also included in the enjoyment of the fruits of, their la of people's yes. labor. Yes. And he says that the violence that occurred was not only directed toward blacks, but was very much directed toward the whites who were participants oh, in absolutely. this coalition, yeah. aimed yeah. at driving them apart. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, progressive whites in the South were slaughtered. I mean, the, the level of violence that was needed in order to get rid of the Reconstruction reforms was, was, was quite high. Uh, and violence was sustaining, this, I mean, like really overt violence, I mean, things like lynching and stuff like that, and raping, and arson. Uh, 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 but that was contingent. You know, President Grant actually sent the Union Army down to destroy the KKK in South Carolina. And he, the Army was very effective for a few years, and you can see this directly in Republican Party voter turnout, okay? Because it's a pretty good proxy for black voter turnout. It just zooms after Grant did that in South Carolina. Um, but, you know, the Northern whites only had so much patience uh, for keeping true, you know, it's taxes. They're, ra you know, Northern whites are racist. They're eager for reconciliation with Southern whites, but they're conceiving of this in terms of reconciliation with the, with the planter class. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's, that's a real problem. But yeah, Southern progressivism, Southern white progressivism is a story that really needs to be told because it was real and active and powerful during the Reconstruction era, and in some ways it's coming back. Um, yeah, I was wondering, I mean, at the case of homeless compelling, I think of this, which is that whether there might be norms that we are undergoing experiments about that are, so I was thinking in particular about monogamy, right? There's a strong monogamy norm in the United States. And I think that in fact, if you look at the data, a lot of people know that a lot of people cheat, they're not monogamous in fact. Yeah, yeah. You know, the world does not collapse <laughs> in virtue of this, in Europe yeah. they have or we're told in France, right, they have more permissive attitudes towards this. Yeah. Um, and so it seems like in that case, the norm is being held on for something other than it working for cooperation and coordination. It's just somehow we well, would feel okay. <laughs> not good about having a norm that uh, made cheating okay or so let's keep in mind that in the United States, virtually all adultery is sneaking around the backs of the spouse. Okay, so it's not, it's a practice, but it's not a norm, because a norm can be practiced publicly. You know, where pe people know, like, what the norm is, and they're going along with it. Uh, uh, so the typical outcome when an affair is exposed in an American marriage, you either get divorced or the adulterous spouse 
dumps the outside part. Yeah, it doesn't continue normally. You could argue that the norm has changed from monogamy to serial. Oh, I agree with that. Yes. I mean, so that's, right. that's in 30 years. Sure. In the 1950s, it was still pretty bad to get divorced for a middle class America. But I take it yeah. that the norm in some other countries is something like turn a blind eye, right? It's not necessarily you tell your partner what you're doing, and that right. seems to work reasonably well. <laughs> <laughs> or at least yeah. just as well, it seems. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I think we'd actually have to do a really detailed study of what meanings people are imputing to marriage and what, they're, what they think they're getting out of marriage, what they want out of marriage. I think it's very complicated. I, it, it's a contingent question. I mean, maybe Americans would be better off uh, with a little loosening. <laughs> but I, I'm not so sure, actually. <laughs> Just a, a little historical point. I, I once uh, had occasion to look through the 1860 census in the uh, southern states to see what percentage of households had slaves. And in the deep south in Mississippi, it was almost 50% of white households yeah. had at least one slave. Yeah. So it really isn't a plant. It's not just a plant planter class. Yeah. Uh, even ordinary small farmers right, frequently have one or two slaves. Yeah. But that wasn't true. That's not true in Virginia, where I think it was 12% or something. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, the very deep south, it was a very deep penetration into the social structure, the, the slave relation. Yes, that's quite right, yeah. Yeah, and in fact it was a kind of, you could see that dramatic differential in how much slavery penetrated the social order that really is arguably what lies behind the precipitation of civil war is that the Deep South started the Civil War, right? It's South Carolina. <laughs> Why? Because they're in a panic that some of the marginal border slave states, maybe they might go along with some program of gradual abolition, which was sort of Lincoln's idea. Who compensates, go slow, right? They were in a panic over this, because if they lost the border states, then they, they couldn't have enough representatives in the Senate to hold slavery together and the rest in, in the hardcore slave states. And that's why they felt if they broke away, they would force the border states in a very difficult position. Hopefully, they'd get them to join the Confederacy. That, that happened for most of them. Have, have you um, read David James's work on sharecrop, the destruction of sharecropping and its consequences for the civil rights movement? No, no, no. What is this? What so is it? He does a county by county analysis throughout the South on the percentage of um, uh, the black population who was engaged in sharecropping in 1910. Yeah. That is at the height of sharecropping. Yeah. And uses that. So sharecropping is destroyed in the d Depression largely. Right. So there's only vestiges of it after World War II. And the question then is. <clears throat> is resistance to the civil rights movement in the 60s most intense in counties that had the highest density of sharecropping. Uh -huh. And that turns out to be a very strong predictor yeah. of resistance to the civil rights movement, net of the percentage of the population that's black. So it isn't just a proxy for black uh, density. That's interesting. Well, you know, now we have this new political science data that looks at uh, southern whites uh, levels of racial resentment and finds it's controlling for like anything you want to control. It's directly connected to percentage of slaves in the county before the Civil War. Which would be You're kidding. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's that's how that's how deep and persistent these attitudes are. Well, and that's of course also yeah. sharecropping cemented that for uh, that same relationship because those yeah. would be the same counties that have high sharecropping. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So one thing, one, one thing that I think this shows is something I'm going to have to build into my story um, is, uh, you know, I talk about biases here, and that could seem awfully cognitive, but in fact, they're deeply emotional. And so one, one thing I need to build in, into this story is something, some kind of sociology of the emotion. 
right? People have, there's, there are deep patterns, not just of racial resentment, but of racial panic in the whole history of the United States. They're continuing to this day. These, these emotional habits are incredibly deeply entrenched. So that, you know, Thomas Pettigrew's argument about there being two kinds of racism in the South, so you, you made the same point, that it's, there's a racism of conformity to racist norms, and there's a racism of identity. Yeah, yeah. Which is different, which are different. So the conformist racists, once you hit the tipping point, they, they're not invested in it, but the identity racists are. Yes. Uh, and so that's, a kind, that's basically the, how you get a rapid change is if the proportion, if the ratios of those are such that most people are just conforming to a norm, then if you can intervene on the behavioral side yeah. and disrupt it, then you can unleash a rapid change. If yeah. most people are identity racists, then if you force the behavioral change and then you pull back on it, they re revert to the previous set point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice way to put it. And, and so then what you want to do is you have to connect that, I think, to identities with things like ideology. Yeah, and the, the emotional <coughs> side is part of the identity idea. Yeah. Quite right, quite right. Um, but it, it's also critical, to, I think, to understand um, how reactionary politics can be made appealing so it's kind of like the what's the matter with Kansas problem, <laughs> right? Uh, so how can you get people whose class interests may well be to engage in a cross-racial integration, you know, integrated coalition to allow themselves basically to be screwed over economically? <laughs> Is that sort of the story of the American South? Um, and white racial identity is absolutely central to that. That is, there are psychic uh, benefits that racism is offering whites. Uh, that even if they are downtrodden economically, they can still see themselves as exalted over blacks. And it, it's those benefits, I think, that are enabling, uh, uh, you know, reactionary politics to be popular and win elections. It's uh, 5.30. I think we should stop and carry on this discussion. <laughs>